We are back in 1 Corinthians, into chapter 8 this week. We've had a couple of weeks looking at chapter 7. We looked at some relationships, <clears throat> looked at what it means to be single, um, going through or transitioning through various stages of relationship status, looked at people who are married, looked at divorce. Um, it, was, it was a big, really, th- three or four weeks looking through that. And uh, as we get into chapter 8, it's different, different topics, different subjects that Paul's moving on to. Remember, this letter is a letter that he wrote in response to a letter that some of the people in Corinth, in Corinth had written to him saying, hey, Paul, help us out. How, do we, how should we understand these kinds of things? Some people say that it's better for a man not to have sexual relations with his wife. Help us understand what does that mean? Some say it's better to be single. Help us understand what does that mean? Some people say we shouldn't eat food like meat. Help us understand. And so we've seen along the way, Paul is answering these questions. And so today we're getting to another one of these questions. In fact, he starts this next chapter. He didn't obviously write chapter eight, but he's, we've split it up into this, into, you know, partition to offer a chapter. <clears throat> and he starts by giving us the title of this next category of questions. This is what he writes, 1 Corinthians 8. Now, we've done talking about sex and singleness and marriage. Now, let's talk about food sacrifice to idols. Something that everybody's, you were wondering about this week. (laughs) Slightly sidetracked by Australian breakdancers and then back on to food sacrifice to idols. But it is actually really important, even for us. Because as we'll come to see, he's just using this as an example of a principle that really matters to us even today. This is what he says. Now, about food sacrifice to idols. He had some questions about idols and food sacrifice to those idols. He says, we know that, and he quotes, we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he does not yet know it as he ought to know it. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. About eating food, sacrifice idols in, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father. All things are from him and we exist for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through him and we exist through him. However, Not everyone has this knowledge. Some have been so used to idolatry up to now that when they eat food sacrificed to an idol, their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are not worse off if we don't eat and we're not better off if we do eat. But be careful that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, the one who has knowledge, Dining in an idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat food offered to idols? So the weak person, the brother or sister for whom Christ died, is ruined by your knowledge. Now when you sin like this against brother and sister and wound their weak conscience, you're sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never eat meat again, so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. So here's here's my, my premise <clears throat> that I believe is what God wants for us from this chapter today. That God wants you to understand that in Christ you are free. We see this over and over and over again. It's, it's a theme of First Corinthians. He's trying to write to the Corinthians who have written to him saying, we've got these questions, and he keeps saying over and over and over again, you're free, you're free. You are f- remember that you're free. And we read a couple of chapters ago, it says everything is permissible, but... Not everything's helpful. You can do anything, but I won't be mastered by anything. Remember when uh, Paul said that back in chapter 6, 5 or 6? God wants you to understand that you are free, but we don't define freedom. And for our freedom, to, to, be, to be truly free, we need to exercise our freedom in a way that glorifies God. And so, in this chapter today, we want to think about this freedom on three levels. So we're going to think about Firstly, where Paul starts, my freedom in Jesus, your freedom in Jesus. Secondly, your freedom in Christ in relation to your responsibility to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And thirdly, your freedom in Christ in relation to your witness to the world or to the culture around us. 
that desperately needs Jesus. So we're going to go through this passage, looking at those three things. My freedom, my freedom in relation to brothers and sisters in the church, and then my freedom, how do I exercise my freedom in relation to people who don't yet know Jesus, or who might be antagonistic towards him, but desperately need him. So let's pray, and then we'll, um, we'll see what God has for us in the passage. And so, Father, we thank you for these words. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. Thank you for your servant Paul and these things written to the Corinthians, but also for us. And help us to grow up in our understanding today and especially help us to grow up in our love. A love for you, a love for one another, and a love for the people who are still in slavery to their sin, who you love and sent your son to save. And so help us in each of these ways. In Jesus' name, amen. So firstly, my freedom in Christ. You, you are freedom. You are free. You're free. Paul writes this to the Galatian church. In fact, if you read through his letters, he writes this over and over and over again. He wants everybody to understand you're free. In Galatians 5, he says, For freedom, Christ set us free. Why don't you set us free? So that you'd be free. And so he says, so stand firm and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. He says, Jesus has freed you from the shackles of sin and brought you into his kingdom, into newness of life even. He says, so don't lose your footing in your freedom and slip back into the yoke of slavery to sin once again. It's interesting how Paul builds his argument in this passage. Again, he uses food. He's used food a few times already. Food is obviously a very big deal in Corinth or in the first century generally, perhaps, because he uses food as an example to a, a couple of places. Food's still a big deal to us today as well. So this is very interesting. He uses food as an example of the contrast between a helpful and an unhelpful exercise of our freedom in Christ. In fact, he goes further and he shows us the difference between a God-glorifying exercise of our freedom in Christ and even what he calls a sinful exercise of our freedom. And you might think, <clears throat> but, we're, but we're free, right? If we're free in Christ and it's for freedom that he's set us free, can't we then go and just live at liberty and do whatever we want? Well, I mean, we've already answered that a couple of chapters ago, but he'll, he'll talk about it again now. The specific example about food he, he uses is food sacrifice to idols. I won't do a show of hands who here has eaten food sacrifice to idols or do you even know what that, like what image does that even conjure up as I say that? Are you thinking like some temple somewhere in a different culture or, or place and they literally kind of sacrifice it and then carve it up and then bring it to your plate? That does actually literally happen. And that may even be what Paul has in mind here. He, he specifically cites people who go to the temple, to a temple, not, not a temple of the Lord, to some other temple. And on the one hand, as he's talking about idols, he tears down the supposed power of these supposed gods. And he says, man, these idols, they're, no, they're, they're nothing. These idols are metal and clay and wood and dirt and dust and nothing. But on the other hand, he also says, but there, but there are powers and principalities in the spiritual. They're not gods like we think of God, but they are worshipped as God. These rebellious spiritual entities, persons, beings, who have some power, who exercise some Authority within their God allotted authority in rebellion against God and even against the people of God. And so Paul doesn't want us to be ignorant of how we exercise our freedom. He says, because on the one hand, those powers have no power over you. You're in Christ. He has defeated the powers of the principalities. He has defeated Sin. He has even overcome death wonderfully. And we are, we're not just waving the Jesus flag, we are, we are that, but we are united in him. We are hidden in him. We share in his inheritance. We share in his authority. 
we share in his perfection, not because we're awesome, not because we balance the karmic scales in our direction, but because of what he has done. He says uh, in verse 4, it says about eating food sacrificed to idols then. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. And there's no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, if for us there is one God, the Father, all things are from him and we exist for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, all things are through him and we exist through him. So he says, ultimately everything is from God and everything is for him, from him and for him. And as part of the fallen creation, there are spiritual forces in rebellion to the Creator. This is what he writes to the church in Ephesus. He says, Be strengthened by the Lord and by His vast strength. Put on the full armour of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So you know, there's people who are in the temple sacrificing to other gods. They are actually not our enemy. They are slaves of our enemy. They are POWs. And they may have Stockholm Syndrome, but they're slaves of our enemy. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. <clears throat> and so Paul's not trying to stir up fear in the minds of the Ephesians or in our minds. But he's trying to help us understand the state of the world. So it says, for this reason, because people aren't our enemy, even if they attack us, they're not our enemies. They're the ones that Jesus has us here to liberate, to preach the good news to, to invite into the family of God. They are captors, they're captives, I should say. They're captives. It says, for this reason, because of their captors, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything, to take your stand. And so he writes to the Galatians saying, stand in your freedom. Don't lose it. Don't become distracted by what looks appealing over there, where the people who are reveling in their rebellion captives of their captors, but rather we would stand firm in our freedom in Jesus. And not only that, but that there are enemies. They're not our enemies, the people, but there are enemies, enemies of God, looking to tear down the things of God, looking to destroy the image bearers of God and distract or discourage or destroy them. So, so we've got to be firm. It's not trying to freak them out. You're just saying, you're standing in Jesus, keep standing in him. Put in the full armor of God, he says. Take your stand against them. So on the one hand, he's saying, when it comes to your liberty in Jesus, the idols have no power. It doesn't matter if this food's been sacrificed to an idol or not. So far it is up to you. It doesn't matter. Because that idol has no power over you. You are hidden in Jesus. He has all authority in heaven and in earth. There is no realm. There is no power that is not under his power. No authority that is not under his authority. And as Jesus sends his church on her mission, on our mission, he declares, all authority has been given to me and therefore you go, and as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And he says, I'm with you. I'm with you. What weapon formed against you can prosper? Paul writes to the Romans. It's a rhetorical question, because there aren't any. If we stand in him. So when it comes to your liberty in Jesus, your exercise of your freedom in Jesus, Paul writes, uh, don't freak out about food. Don't freak out about idols. You're free. Go for it. Go for it. He says, but, but, on the other hand, he's taking the issue very seriously because these spiritual forces are very real. Again, they're not, they're not gods like God. They're worshipped as gods, but they're not gods. They are spiritual 
beings, maybe even powerful spiritual beings, they're not gods, although worshipped as gods. And just because you're free, Paul writes, doesn't mean that your weaker brother or sister, and certainly the culture around you, they are not free from the predations of our spiritual enemies. This is Paul's caveat to your freedom. So, so when it comes to your own freedom in Christ, he says, stand firm in your union with Christ, walk in freedom. He goes on, uh, chapter 10, this is what he writes. He, he kind of continues this thought. He says, he repeats himself. He says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. So chapter 6, he says, <clears throat> you know, not everything's permissible. Sorry, everything's permissible. Not everything's beneficial. This, uh, and then he says, not everything is, I'm getting confused. I'm so sorry. Everything is permissible. Not everything's beneficial. Everything's permissible. I won't be mastered by anything. And now he comes back to that theme. He says, everything is permissible. Not everything's beneficial. Everything's permissible. Not everything builds up. And so he's casting our minds off of ourselves and onto somebody else in how we exercise our freedom. He goes on, no one is to seek his own good, but the good of the other person. He says, eat everything that's sold in the meat market without raising questions for the sake of conscience, since the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If any of the unbelievers invite you over and you want to go, eat everything that's set before you without raising questions for the sake of conscience. But if someone says to you, this food is from a sacrifice, don't eat it. Out of consideration for the one who told you for the sake of conscience. I don't mean your own conscience, but the other person's. For why is my freedom judged by another person's conscience? If I partake with thanksgiving, why am I criticized because of something for which I give thanks? So... He says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also try to please everyone and everything, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many so that they may be saved. So again, he's using this example of food sacrificed to idols and he restates what he says before, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Again, you're free in Jesus. You're free. It says you go to someone, so someone invites you over, they don't know Jesus, or in fact, even if they're in abject rebellion against Jesus and worship one of the so called gods who is in active rebellion against King Jesus. He says, go for it if you want to. Whatever they put before you, you eat it. You don't have to worry about it. Has this meat been sacrificed to idols? He says, in fact, you know what? Don't even ask. He says, because if you don't ask, then they won't know that you know you're eating something sacrificed to idols and then you're just living in your freedom in Jesus and no conscience is damaged. So as you go to the meat market, it says there's a range of different cultures and different uh, religions and they all prepare the meat different ways and sacrifice here and there or whatever. It says, just don't ask them. Don't ask them. Just with thanksgiving. Treat it all as a gift from God because it is. Just go ahead and just eat. It sounds like maybe Paul's saying ignorance is bliss, but it's the exact opposite. He's saying it's not because of ignorance you can participate, it's because of your knowledge of the supremacy of Jesus that you can participate and eat it all. It's not ignorance, it's actually the knowledge of the Lordship of Jesus, the surpassing greatness of Christ, that you can eat anything. So you don't want to play cute with it or gain the system in this. Like uh, um, Beck and I have this uh, kind of rule that we have when we fast, that if we go to someone's house and they offer us food, we're like, well, th- this trumps our fast, and so we'll participate. Or if we're, if we're only fasting certain kinds of food, like um, sweets or junk food or whatever, and then someone offers us sweets or junk food, then we don't want to be rude, right? And, and that trumps our fast. But then if we weren't, Kind of, if we just felt like something delicious, but we're fasting, and then we went and we know, we know if someone offers us something, we, we are going to say yes. We kind of go out of our way to be offered it. That kind of like, it's not really in the spirit of the, of the thing, right? So I think we can apply the same thinking to what Paul's saying here. We don't want to gain the system, but he says, you're free. So stand in your freedom. You don't need to check because the power of the idol has no power over you. You don't need to ask. 
So as you eat the meat, sacrifice to idols, it's not going to be beneficial to you and it's not going to be detrimental to you because it's been sacrificed to an idol. It's just, a, it's just meat which was given by God. Saying you're, you're completely free to eat what you like with thanksgiving because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. But there's one rule we need to follow. And that is love governs our exercise of freedom. If I was doing the Don translation of 1 Corinthians 8, that would be my headline. Love governs our exercise of freedom. He writes, verse 1, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. So you know something. What you know is that the food sacrifice to idols has no power, no good power, no bad power. There's no magic in it, although it may have been sacrificed to an idol in order to imbue it with some sort of magic. Paul's saying, that doesn't matter. You go for it. If it's tasty and your conscience allows, go for it. Verse 7 says, however, not everyone has this knowledge. Some have been so used to idolatry up to now that when they eat food sacrificed to an idol, their conscience being weak is defiled. And it's not having a go at them. He's not saying, oh, they're weak, so that's, that sucks. He's not writing them off saying, well, they're weak. They'll grow. You exercise your freedom. Stand in your freedom. Go for it. And, and they'll learn, baby. That's not what he's saying. Uh, in verse 10, he says, If someone sees you, the one who has knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat food offered to idols? So you might think, but I'm free. It's for freedom that Christ set us free. It has no power over me. Aren't, aren't I being a good and mature example of somebody living in my freedom? Shouldn't my brother or sister look at me and go, oh, I want to be like that person, and therefore I'm going to... He says, no, he's already described the situation. They're so used to idolatry. They've come out of that idolatry. That for them, it, it does something to their conscience. They can't, in good conscience, exercise their freedom in that same way without the risk of coming back under the slavery to sin. And so Paul says, the, for the weaker brother or sister... He's not making excuses for them. He's trying to identify a very real situation. That's true probably for most of us, in, not in this necessarily, but in, in some activity of life. There are some things that's just not helpful for us to participate in, whether because of the culture around us or because of a history of participating in those things. Even if they're good things, Paul doesn't, get us, Paul doesn't let us get away with the kind of thinking that says, but I'm free, so they should just grow up. Because love governs our exercise of freedom. We are beholden to one another. In particular, the stronger, the more mature are beholden to the weak and the less mature. So Paul finishes this thought to the Corinthians like this. Verse 11. So the weak person, the brother or sister for whom Christ died, remember who they are. Jesus loves this person. Is ruined by your knowledge. So you know this thing, you're exercising this thing with disregard for them and you are actually corrupting a brother or sister who doesn't, who, who may have the same knowledge but is, can't experience the same kind of freedom in that area. Now, when you sin like this against brothers or sisters and wound their weak conscience, you're sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never again eat meat so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. He takes this issue incredibly seriously. Saying, I, I am beholden to my brother or sister. He writes this to the Philippians. He says, I'm going to prefer the need of the other. We have this great example of Jesus. We're going to do the same. To one another. He writes this to the Romans, actually. The, the same thing. He says, the same activity for you, eating the food, is a wonderful, God-glorifying exercise of, the, of your freedom in Christ when done with thanksgiving. But when it causes a brother or sister to fall, it actually becomes sin. So the same activity, the, the same thing. I'm eating this meat. I didn't ask about it. 
I'm eating it, exercising my freedom, and then they say, oh, this food is sacrificed to idols. I say, oh, I, I won't do that. Because my brother or sister here, who, who I know and love, who Jesus loves, if I continue eating, and then, I, and then they go, oh, well, maybe it's not such a big deal. And they go against their conscience, and they participate in a way that leads them back into slavery. Paul says, for me to exercise my freedom like that is sinning against them, sinning against Jesus. Because love governs my exercise of freedom. <clears throat> Romans, I mentioned. He writes this to the Romans. I know, and I'm persuaded in the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself. So he's trying to make the same point. So it doesn't matter. I, I'm totally free from having to worry about whether or not this has been sacrificed to idols. Still, to someone who consider who considers a thing to be unclean, to that one, it is unclean. So it's come back and saying, well, we need to consider our conscience as well. For if your brother or sister is hurt by what you eat, you're no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy by what you eat someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be slandered, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and receives human approval. So then, let us pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. Do not tear down God's work because of food. Everything's clean, but it's wrong to make someone fall by what he eats. It's a good thing not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself for what he approves. But whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that's not from faith is sin. So again, again, he's come back to our conscience. If we're like, well, I, I have done this over and over and over again for so long in a way that it's contrary to God, but now I am in Jesus, and I'm free. For some, they will then be able to say, and now I can do this in a way that glorifies God in my freedom. And some will say, I just can't go back there. What Paul's saying is, they're both okay. Both of those approaches are fine. You don't have to try to prove that you're free by doing the things that, that go against your conscience. It says both of, both of those are appropriate, God-glorifying exercises of your freedom. Freedom to partake and freedom to abstain. So, so live in your freedom. Stand firm in your freedom. Saying, now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbour for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And that's why <clears throat> Paul writes, I would just give up meat completely. If I had to. If I had to, I'd just give it up. For men, I wouldn't cause a brother or sister to stumble. I remember uh, a long time ago, um, I was about to start as a pastor at a Baptist church and had a rule that the pastors didn't drink alcohol. And for my conscience, I had no problem with drinking alcohol. I had no problem with alcohol, like no, no problems in that regard. <clears throat> and I was talking to my, to my dad, I'm like, I mean, I, I really, I don't drink a lot of alcohol. Uh, I have no problem kind of signing that I won't. And when I, when I was a pastor, I didn't drink a drop of alcohol for almost five years. So I did what I said I was going to do, even though I didn't have a problem with that. And I was talking to my dad and he said, oh man, when I was younger, uh, one of my best mates did have a problem with alcohol. And my dad is like, I never had a problem with alcohol. I really, you know, enjoy it, Ex exercise of freedom, go for it. He said, but when I heard my friend told his wife, my friend who had a problem with alcohol, tell his wife, well, it's okay for Bill, so it's okay for me. My dad stopped cold drinking alcohol because of this exact thing. It's like, I cannot exercise my freedom in Jesus in a way that causes my brother or sister to fall. I am beholden to them. And you might go, that's not fair. But a goal, the goal of our life is not to fill our stomach with good food. The goal of our life is not to drink alcohol. Even if you have a clear conscience in both of those areas. Our goal is to 
pursue Jesus and to point others to him as well. So Paul's trying to bring us back. That's why it starts with the supremacy of Jesus and the, the wonder of our freedom in him, what he's done for us, what he's purchased for us. And then he says this caveat, we don't exercise our freedom at the cost of our brothers and sisters. Love governs our exercise of freedom. Thirdly, what about your freedom in Christ in relation to your witness to the world or the culture around us? Those people who need Jesus. Again, we see this answer uh, in, in this part of chapter 10, verse 27. It says, if any of the unbelievers invites you over and you want to go, so says, you, know, you don't have to go, but if you want to go, eat everything that's set before you. Be a good guest. So if someone invites you over, be a good guest. Don't say, well, I can't eat. Is this sacrifice to idols? Because you know I can't, sacri- I can't eat something sacrificed to idols. So don't even ask them. Live in your freedom without raising questions for the sake of conscience. But if someone says to you, this food is from a sacrifice, don't eat it, out of consideration for the one who told you, and for the sake of conscience, not your conscience, but their conscience. And he says, I don't care if I'm judged by them. If it was just up to me and just about my exercise of freedom, I would say, eat away, go for it. He says, that, I don't care if they, if they judge me for eating something sacrificed to some other God that God has no power of me. I have freedom of this. God, my God, the God gave this to me. He says, but it's for them, for their sake. I won't do it. Again, a governing principle of love over freedom extends to those who don't know Jesus or who are, who are living in rebellion against him. We're still in some sense beholden to them as well in our exercise of freedom. We live in some sense, we saw this with our marriages, we saw this with sex, we saw this with food before, in some sense, how we live and what we eat and how we eat what we eat speaks or or preaches or prophetically proclaims what we know. Prophetically proclaims our freedom. This is true of how we speak, how we spend our money. It shows people who don't know Jesus what we hold to be true. And in that way, way again, it's, it's, prophetically our communication, it's prophetically communicating where our allegiance lies, where our hope comes from, where our, where our joy, where the source of our joy is from in him. And it communicates the lordship of Jesus. When we eat in freedom, it communicates the lordship of Jesus. When we abstain, it communicates the Lordship of Jesus. Or we say, I, I won't eat this meat, <clears throat> not because I'm not free to, but because I don't want you to be bound. You don't have to say these words, but when we abstain, it communicates this for your sake, not because I'm not free, but for your sake, so that you would come to know and live in the freedom of Jesus. It communicates the seriousness of the rebellion, of the spiritual power being worshipped in the sacrifice of that food. Where we say, oh, actually, it's not like, you know, there's a pantheon of gods and, and all the gods are kind of at war with each other and we'll see which one gets up and you sacrifice him and I can't participate in that because that's helping your God and not my God. This is, this is not the case. But it is the case that they are being worshipped as gods, those who are in rebellion against the God. And we want to, we are sent to be liberators of those captives, to set the captives free. And so it's part, how we eat food or don't eat food is a part of our witness in that sense. It's important to know as well, it's not just about food. So again, Paul's using food as an example that really covers over many aspects of our lives. He's trying to help us understand again the freedom that we have and that we should be walking in our freedom and don't let other people steal your freedom or, or make you question your freedom, or see your conscience, or, or judge you for exercising your freedom, go for it, but be governed by love. Saying in food, but in every area of your life. Don't become a slave again to sin. Come under the yoke of sin. And in every aspect of your life, exercise your freedom governed by love. So this week, in light of chapter 8, and a little bit of chapter 10 we saw, We're going to be doing the work. You're going to be doing the work, actually, in your life. 
and I will in my life, and we will in our discipleship groups and in your families, of considering the great freedom we have in Jesus and the freedoms we have in him. Like, really, we're going to do the work of understanding how liberated we are in Jesus. Not just from sin and from the penalty of sin and the, and the promise one day of even being free from the power of sin, uh, uh, sorry, the, the presence of sin, but also what it means for us in our daily lives, the freedom that we have. We're going to consider the powers and principalities and how they're at work in the world against God and his people, how they are continuing to keep captives bound. We're going to consider how we are on mission to see those captives liberated. And we're going to look at how do we exercise our freedoms, governed by love, with regard to our brothers and sisters and with regard to those who are still captives. It's going to be a big week for us. It's going to be a liberating week. Man, I, hope that you, I hope you do grow in the knowledge of your freedom. Just because Paul says, you know, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, uh, he, he prefaces that all by saying, oh, it's because of the knowledge that you have that you can walk in the freedom of your liberty in Jesus. So we do want knowledge, but knowledge governed by love. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for, again, the, the wonder of the freedom we have in Jesus that we don't have to worry or be concerned with uh, you know, this thing or that thing or this idol or this power, this principality, but in everything, we stand firm in Jesus. Help us to stand firm with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, Shoes of readiness, helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit, which is your word, that we would be able to stand as we go about your business in the world of seeing captives freed. Thank you for freeing us from the penalty of our sin, from our rebellion against you, from our, from our distance from you into sonship, into your family, even into unity with Jesus. Thank you for gifting us your Holy Spirit and help us to stand in the power of your Holy Spirit against every attack. And Father, my request is that as we go about your business, we on the figurative attack, knowing you go before us, preparing good works in advance for us to walk in, that we would walk in them boldly, armoured, sought at the ready. Help us to not view others as the enemy, but to have the same love for them that you have and had for us while we were still in our sin, and you sent your Son. Help us to exercise our freedom, governed by love. Not not just good feelings or, or vibes, but the kind of love that we have received from you in Jesus. That we'd have the same kind of love for one another. I pray all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.